It's a deliberate deception. Because of the deliberate deception of racism, some people are literally lost. They are fragile without the sense of a superior identity that it offers them. And that's why I believe we better do some real spiritual and political and historical discernment about these statues and why they mean so much to some people because there's been some misinterpretation in the media. 80% of these statues were raised between 1898 and 1922. Most of the statues, like the one in the park here, were raised to glorify deliberate deception. They were not raised immediately following the Civil War. They could not have been raised immediately following the Civil War because even Robert E. Lee said not to raise them following the Civil War. The only way we get healing in this moment is as my grandma said, you got to know when you're dealing with some old demons. Not no buck private just arrived demon, but old demon. And the only way you can deal with that is folk got to know how to come together and stand because they have fasted and prayed and they choose love and truth and grace and nonviolent determination over anything else. Lord help us here. I, I, I know justice is, justice is coming soon. I, I know justice is, justice is coming soon. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Mm for a long time. 
That's right. Fight night and day. Ooh. We can't stop fighting, y'all. Cause justice is on the way. Come on and fight on. Just a little while longer. Fight on. and eternal God, one whom we call Father, Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah. We thank you for determined spirits and for a knowledge that does not depend merely on men or women and for a peace that passeth all understanding. Hold us and help us now. Keep us and somehow use us that words, lips of clay might speak some words of life. For we ask it now in your name. Amen. Amen. I humbled Seth and others by the invitation to come and preach on this holy day and on this holy ground. For wherever the blood of martyrs are shed, it is holy ground. I'm thankful for the Charlottesville clergy, the congregants Charlottesville and the work that you're doing and the way that you are leading this nation when certainly we need some leading and sanity to override the craziness. I a few weeks ago, was, supposed, was, was asked to be here by Seth and others and Tracy Blackman and Jennifer Butler, but Yara and I and my whole team, Charmaine and Jonathan and Clinton and Erica, who both were here, have been organizing and planning for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival with my co-chair, Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who's on her way here now. And those travels had landed us in Mississippi. And I, we could not be here. 
And yes, Yara has been, like all of us, singing and ministering around the country. And yesterday, something jumped on me physically, and some people said not to be here, and then today, her voice. But I come from an old part of my family's Pentecostal. Yes, sir. <laughs> and you know Methodists were the original Pentecostal holiness. <laughs> so he is right, it's all right to say amen. amen. And my, some of the grandmothers and mothers that I knew, Seiko, taught us how to recognize the difference between a somatic attack and the psychosomatic attack. In other words, they taught us how to recognize when there were other forces at work to try and stop you from doing what you needed to do. And in those moments, you have to push through in the spirit and trust the holiness and the holiness of God. Thank you, Yara, for pushing through. Uh, thank you for all of you. And you're in one of those moments. Here in this city, you've got to push through, but you're not pushing through by yourself. God cannot, you can never apologize or tell folk that following the way of God will be carefree, stressless, and without burden. In fact, in the tradition I come up in, Jonathan, I'm told that we're supposed to take up the cross and take up the yoke of God. And there is a place where we have to be able, willing to bear the burdens that are the necessary com companion of doing what is right. You heard the reading today from Mark chapter 2 about this paralyzed man and his four friends and the healing of Jesus. I want to suggest today that God's love requires breaking through barriers. God's love requires breaking through barriers. In fact, God loves a breakthrough. If you follow the Rivana River out of Charlottesville, down through the rolling green hills of Virginia, you will eventually come to the James River. And if you follow the James River on down toward the shore, you will come to the place where in 1619, some 20 enslaved Africans were disembarked upon the Powhatan land that the English called their settlement. We are gathered, sisters and brothers, here not far from the site of America's original sin. What you wrestled with and are wrestling with has been the wrestling match of America's history. And what happened here in Charlottesville which is connected to a long legacy, happened exactly eight days before the 398th anniversary of the date, August 20th, 1619, when slaves were first brought in chains as chattel to this land, considered property, not the property of God, but the property of men. We cannot <clears throat> face the brutal violence that erupted in this town on August 12th without facing that sin. The original heresy 
and sin of slavery and the bad theology, the evil economics, the sick sociology, and the heretical ontology and the systemic racism that has been the foundation of it in this land we call America. And we cannot face the fierce urgency of confronting white supremacy without the truth that God's love requires a breakthrough. The letter to the Ephesians admonishes us to speak the truth in love, for we are members of one another. I want to make it clear tonight that I'm here tonight as a Christian preacher, not as a politician, not as a political figure, but as a consecrated bishop in our Lord's church. And I'm here along with other sisters and brothers of faith. But I'm also here as a son of America with the blood of people who have been called black, people who have been called white, and people who have been called Indian running through my veins. In my veins, the struggle has existed. In my very DNA, the wrestling match set between what God says about us and what racism says about us has always been at work. When I was born, my father's first protest in Indiana, not in the South, but in the Methodist hospital in Indiana, was his demand that they not merely put Negro on my birth certificate. When he raised the challenge, looking at my skin color, they said, I'm a Negro. I was born in the same hospital Miss Fletcher was born in. My father said no. He has the blood of Tuscarora Indians in his blood. He has cousins whose eyes are as blue as any white person. He has cousins who are white, and he has cousins who for various reasons were so light-skinned that they ran north to pass in order to escape the turbulent violence of racism in the South. I'm here to speak the truth in love, my brothers and sisters, because we are members of one another whether we like it or not. As Dr. King said, we are inextricably bound together in a single garment of destiny. This is the message Jesus was preaching in Galilee. You might turn this down just a tad. When four friends loved a man, I don't know if these friends agreed on everything. I don't know if they agreed on every tactic. I don't know if they agreed all the time on how they ought to move forward. But what they did agree on was that this man was paralyzed. And the situation, the moment demanded that they find a way to work together. Because they needed to get him to Jesus, that brown-skinned Palestinian Jew who had set up a mass meeting for healing. Here was a man crippled by disease, but disabled by exclusion. Unclean, the religious folk called him, and word had got out that Jesus had a community mass meeting, a healing meeting, that Jesus was welcoming everybody, that there was a place with Jesus for someone who had been rejected. Jesus was defying tradition defying racism, defying whatever isms were existing in that day, Jesus in that moment sounded like the lady in the harbor that some folk want to ignore today. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. (laughs) 
Give me the wretched refuge of your teeming shores. Send those, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. But the defenders of the status quo, to Jesus' message sounded like a threat. What if they all get healed and start being involved with the government? What if they get healed and decide to run for president? <laughs> they could not envision a world of everybody together. The only world they could envision was one of antagonism where for one person to be healed was to replace somebody else from their healing. And that's not what Jesus was teaching. Revolutionary love is a balm to the broken and the hurting. But revolutionary love is a challenge to those held captive by fear. Dr. Isher, I believe, is it Richard Lisha at Duke, once time, one time told an audience, G Martin King got killed not for loving. That's not what killed him. If he, had st if he would have stuck with the normal categories that people like for their loving. Love those in your race. Love those that treat you right. Love those that uh, agree with you politically. But Dr. King walked into the Congress and walked into the systems of power and said, how do these laws represent the love you claim? And that, my friends, will get you enemies among the status quo. But God loves a breakthrough because it reveals how love conquers fear. And in this text, love conquers fear by taking the roof off. By letting the light of truth shine in. I want you to understand that they didn't push their way through the crowd to get the man in. They found a nonviolent way to get the man in the presence of God. Now Chad Myers, a New Testament scholar of some renown, is clear and says that the man here and his paralysis represents the nation. The nation at that time that was paralyzed by domination. Chad Myers said the whole gospel of Mark and being the gospel that Peter dictated to John Mark, that the whole gospel is about taking on the systems, the demonic systems that had so subjugated the people of ancient Israel and so mimicked the Caesars and the narcissist of that day. And here is some truth that America must hear from Charlottesville if she's ever gonna deal with racism. Racism is the roof, it's the barrier. It's the wall that keeps America from the healing she needs. And truth, love, justice, and nonviolent determination is the hammer, the only hammers that can break through the barriers. And there are some barriers we gotta break through, my friend. The first one is we have to break through is deliberate deception. That's a tool of racism. That's one of those walls. That's one of those roofs. I pastored in Virginia, Martinsville, Virginia, some years ago. I pastored, began pastoring right at the time Nelson Mandela was free. And Douglas Wilder became governor of the state of Virginia while the N-word was still in the state song of Virginia. Hmm. And I couldn't understand why the man who ran against Mr. Brother Wilder kept calling for recalls. I don't know if y'all remember that. Over and over and over again. I was a young preacher then, and I said one night in Bible study, I just don't understand what his problem is. And one of the old Ill illiterate deacons of the church, but filled with great wisdom said, boy, he could say that to me. He said, boy, what you don't understand is that racism is such a devious thing. And the problem with the man who keeps calling for the recalls is he can't admit that he lost 
without facing the fact that his mama lied to him. That ought to give you some compassion for those who harbor racism because it means that if you've been taught all the way up that racism is the way, yeah. hatred is the way, and then something happens. He, he said, look, his mama taught him that, that maybe in basketball or football, but if he ever decided to run for governor in a state where the N-word was still in the state song, there's no way he could be successful. And yet it happened, and yet it happened. And he couldn't admit he was wrong without admitting that his mama had lied to him. And my brothers, that in some ways is the hurtful side of racism because you got to admit that those that raised you lied to you. My God, one author calls it white fragility that can be easily triggered by an opportunist, especially a narcissistic opportunist, <laughs> who uses fear-mongering and otherization that points to other races and other sexualities and other immigration immigrant status as the cause of all your problems. It's a deliberate deception. And because of the deliberate deception of racism, some people are literally lost. They are fragile without the sense of a superior identity that it offers them. And that's why I believe we better do some real spiritual and political and historical discernment about these statues and why they mean so much to some people because there's been some misinterpretation in the media. Most of the statues, like the one in the park here, were raised to glorify deliberate deception. They were not raised immediately following the Civil War. They could not have been raised immediately following the Civil War because even Robert E. Lee said not to raise them following the Civil War. Eighty percent of these statues, I've got a good historian here, Tim Tyson, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, 80% of these statues were raised between 1898 and 1922. 1898 was two years after Plessy versus Ferguson. And 1898 was the year of the worst coup d'etat in American history when duly elected black and white people were run out of the town of Wilmington. Black people were killed and they were taken out of office. Eight, November 10th, 1898, and a telegram went all over America saying this is how you restore power rightfully to the white man. And churches prayed during the services before that Tuesday, November 10th, and some of them prayed, Lord, if we have to fill up the river of the Cape, the Cape Fear River with the blood of the, then Lord, Give us the strength. When were these statues raised? It was the period when white supremacy and Jim Crow were once again fully implemented and codified into the political system. When were these statues raised? They were raised during the time in 1902 when the last African American was run out of the United States Congress and all of the southern legislatures that had once for a brief period of time being controlled by black and white fusion politicians who had rewritten the constitution from Virginia to Texas. When were, they writ when were these statues raised? When black men were being lynched on an average of one per day and there was no anti-lynching law in America and the first anti-lynching law wasn't even proposed until 1924 and it was proposed by Leonidas Dyer from Ferguson. 
a white Republican who proposed it. It was passed in the House, defeated in the Senate, and after that he never won election again. When were these statues raised? They were raised in the period between 1898 and 1922 when Woodrow Wilson, a man from New Jersey but born in the South, an educated man, but education doesn't keep you from racism. It might make you more shrewd about how you engage it. <laughs> President of a college, governor of a state, and he won the presidency in 1914-15, and upon his, civil, his victory, he kicked civil rights leaders out of the Oval Office. Kicked them out, William Trotter. And then in 1916, he played birth of a nation in the Oval Office called the Klansmen that glorified the Klan and said that black and white politicians of the 1800 that worked together in the South were the cause of the ruin of the country. He played that to his entire staff a hundred years before Bannon was in the White House. You better hear me today. A uh, hundred years before Woodrow Wilson he played that movie. That movie was written by a playwright from Cleveland County, North Carolina. Shelby, North Carolina. He was a white supremacist and a, and a preacher, a southern preacher, and a member of the state legislature. This is an aside. Where did Dylan Ruth end up at? He found his way to Cleveland County, to Shelby, the home of the author of the Klansman, the home of the author of this ugly movie that was played in the Oval Office. And then Woodrow Wilson ended desegregation of the armed forces, rolled back the final vestiges of Reconstruction. And it was in this period that 80% of those statues were raised. The one here was commissioned in 1919, which means it was commissioned just three years after Woodrow Wilson played Birth of a Nation. It was commissioned during the time he was rolling back civil rights laws and appointing attorney generals that would do the same thing. These statues were raised to glorify not the southern history cause, but deliberate deception and the full return and codification of white supremacy and white nationalism and they were raised with the belief by the white supremacist and nationalists that they finally had a deceiver in chief in the White House that would promote and promulgate and work to pass laws rooted in deliberate deception and the deception of white supremacy. And so to have a real breakthrough, you gotta ask, what signal are people given like Unite the Right when they march around these statues? What is it? Are they signaling? that they see some similarities now that line up with what happened then. And that is why to heal, we're talking about healing, you have to break through because denouncing extremist hate is not necessarily denouncing white nationalism and white supremacy. Mm-mm, mm-mm. We also, if we're going to heal, we must break through deliberate demonization. Can I work for a minute in here? Yes, sir. Take your time. I, I, you know, healing takes some time. It, you just don't throw stuff on healing. You can get a scab and not have healing. You see, deliberate demonization, the lie of white supremacy, isn't about whether you have a black friend or a white friend. Yes, Institutional racism is written into policy. For, for instance, after the civil rights movement, those who benefited from, the, from, from, from many of the, the, of the kinds of services that were opened up used deliberate demonization 
to perpetrate the culture of racism without appearing to be racist. They use code words and dog whistles. Tim Wise, a scholar, a white scholar, by the way, notes how the very social programs, the very social programs that lifted many whites out of poverty were racialized by certain people and spoken of in a negative way as being undeserving entitlements. Southern Dixiecrats called them undeserving entitlements just as soon as black and brown people were given access to these programs post the 1954 Supreme Court decision. Because you do know that, it, that most black people could not pay into Social Security until 1954. Because the deal that was cut in 1935 was that if you worked in the agrarian culture or you worked as a domestic, you couldn't pay into Social Security. So, and that was the only way Franklin Delano Roosevelt was able to get it passed. Hmm. And it was 19 years before that law was changed, 1954. And it was around that time that people, be certain people, began to suggest that you could use the word undeserved entitlement as another code word for racism. Deliberate demonization, the Southern strategy was its name. It was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way to drive certain Southern whites to vote for conservative white politicians and leave the ranks of the Democratic Party that had elected people like John Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson. And hold on, I've got something to say about the Democrats. They don't get off scot-free either. <laughs> but these had helped to usher in with really the help of the movement to put in place public policy goals and demands of the civil rights movement. In a starkly revealing interview, Former GOP strategist Lee Atwater boldly described how the Southern strategy worked to overturn and undermine fusion movements between black and whites in the South, which had built up an expanded democracy. He said this, it's hard, but in order to get healing, you have to hear. He said, this is the guy who ran the Willie Horton campaign. He said, you start out in 1954 saying nigger, nigger, nigger. But by 1968, you can't say nigger because it'll hurt you, it'll backfire. So you say stuff like force busing or states' rights and all that stuff. Then you get really abstract and you talk about cutting taxes. And all of these things you're talking about sound like they're totally economics. But the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites and you allow whites to blame black and brown people for their problems. Atwater, Atwater would manage George H.W. Bush's successful run for the presidency in 1988. And then Alexander P. Lamus, a political science professor at Case Western Reserve University, quoted him, quoted Atwater in the book Southern Politics in the 1960s. Now the target of the Southern strategy was to invite racism in to the political structure, particularly in the southern states of the old Confederacy. And the goal was to solidify from Maryland or Virginia to Texas, 13 former Confederate states to guarantee 171 electoral votes for anybody running for president, 31% of the United States House of Representatives, 26 senators, and 13 state houses that could write the laws around voter suppression. But, in the, but you also got to understand how it worked. On June 11th, 1963, watch this now, the day before Mega Evers is killed. June 12th, I believe, Mega was killed. And I know it was in June. George Wallace stood in the door of Foster Auditorium at University of Alabama and pretended to defy desegregation. He knew it was going to take place, but he did it within a week he received 100,000 congratulatory telegrams and more than 95% of his mail came from the North. The fan mail persuaded 
the slick haired demagogue from Alabama to run for the 1964 Democratic presidential nomination. People said it was pointless, but in Wisconsin, more than a third of the state's Democrats cast their ballot for George Wallace. And he didn't spend a dime. All he did was play the race card. Three weeks later, Wallace landed 30% of the votes cast in Indiana. And scholars tell us that two Ku Klux Klan members ran a shoestring campaign out of a service station phone booth. And using the poison of race, he got 30% of the vote. In Maryland's Democratic primary, Wallace won 16 of the state's 23 counties and 43% of the final tally. And he said if it had not been, and I won't repeat the word again, we would have won the whole thing. Now Wallace didn't win, but his, his, his performance was so surprising that Republican George H.W. Bush said he was going to run for the U.S. Senate. He never held elective office before. Bush declared himself emphatically opposed to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, saying that it trampled upon the Constitution by mandating equal access to restaurants, hotels, restrooms, and other public accommodation. And he explained to the crowd, this is in the 60s, the new Civil Rights Act was passed to protect 14% of the people. I'm worried about 86% of the people. Inviting, inviting the paralysis of racism. Then the Gold War, the campaign started and it, it launched a new conservatism. Now he didn't win, he didn't win, but Strom Thurmond campaigned hard for Gold War. And Strom Thurmond became indispensable in Richard Nixon's Southern strategy. And Nixon and other tutors like Goldwater, he had um, uh, 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 George Wallace, who's American Independent Party candidacy, th that the year was the only real threat to Nixon's presidential candidate in 1968. In 1968, Wallace runs this third party campaign. And according to historian Dan Carter, Wallace becomes the most influential loser in the 21st century. He taught the new and far more conservative Republican Party how to use the language of anti-elitism, anti-communism, and various euphemism of race to inflame the voters. If you Google George Wallace's 1968 speech in Madison Square Garden, it sounds almost like our current president's stump speeches. Nixon also used his friendship with certain quote-unquote white evangelicals in order to get a kind of consecration of his flaming these racial tension. Nixon's Southern strategy had a number of authors. Pat Buchanan, who was a young right-wing editorial writer from the St. Louis Globe, Democrat, Harry Dent, an aide to Strom Thurmond, Sparrow Agnew, who was Nixon's running mate, and John Mitchell, who would become his attorney. Nixon chose Agnew, governor of a border state, primarily because of the way Agnew threw his diatribes at mainstream black leaders. He used Agnews to say in public what he did not say, to create what Nixon's strategists call positive polarization. Now, the real architect, however, was Kevin Phillips, whose book, The Emerging Republican Majority, was published after the election, but in manuscript had already become the virtual Bible of Nixon's 1968 campaign. This is what Phillips says. He says, the melt America is the melting pot that never melted, and explain that all you've got to do with American politics is work out who hates who, and you've got it. Philip advised Nixon that the Republican Party could win without Negro votes, in fact, by painting the Democrats as a black party. And then he said white ethnics in the North were also ripe for the picking, correctly predicting that there was a rift that could be played even in the Northern states. Even in the Northern states. And Nixon used this coding language. 
He used it in the Southern strategy. He got Jesse Helms and Strom Thurmond and all of them to lead the Democratic Party and to come in. And it's interesting that one of the commentators, Richard Painter, is now making this, this talking about this all over the news. We should have been talking about it long ago and understanding it. Nixon derided school integration as an arbitrary federal interference with state and local prerogative. He endorsed the so-called freedom of choice. He promised Thurman, Thurman that he would lift federal guidelines that call for cutting funding to school districts that refuse to desegregate. He played the white nationalist card without sounding like it. And he said, that if you let me play, Thurman said to Walt, Walt Nixon, if you let me play, we'll make it so that the majority of white Southerners will never go back to the Democratic Party and they will never form relationship with black people. And in 68, Nixon would have won a landslide, but Wallace siphoned off 13.5% of the vote. Why did I say that today in a place where there's healing needed? You can't get healing unless you diagnose the problem. The moment you're in is not going to be healed by just coming together singing, we are the world. <laughs> the only way we get healing in this moment is, as my grandma said, you got to know when you're dealing with some old demons. Not no buck private, just arrived demons but oh demon and the only way you can deal with that is folk got to know how to come together and stand because they have fasted and prayed and they choose love and truth and grace and nonviolent determination over anything else My friend, my friend, my friend, my friend, that's a little bit on the mic, turn it up. Don't let anybody tell you that the problem is just Trump. That's a misdiagnosis. Trump is a symptom. Now, yes, he has emboldened and embraced the language and the policies of white supremacy that you faced here in Charlottesville. And yes, they feel like they can take their hoods off and stand proud with Trump in the White House like they thought they could in 1919 when they first raised the statue here. But long before Trump mastered the con of the Southern strategy. He had an audience that had been cultivated for more than 50 years. And what should surprise us is not that he used the strategy but that he was so successful so easily with it in the 21st century and the media and hardly anybody else could diagnose the deliberate demonization that was going on right in front of our eyes. And then there's one final thing and that is the deliberate disunity. Not only the deliberate deception, deliberate demonization, but we must break through the deliberate disunity the distraction of divide and conquer tactics. For instance, we're going all over now the country organizing and one of the things we've done is we've done some mapping and Seth, <laughs> it's amazing. We have these maps and we start with voter suppression as a form of systemic racism. Would y'all agree? The Supreme Court, I mean even the Roberts Court has agreed that voter suppression and racialized gerrymandering is racism, inherent and intentional, right? The Roberts Court, unanimous. The Lord is still on his throne. The Roberts Court. Everybody voted, even Clarence Thomas, the Roberts Court. Even the new appointee, right? 
But what we've done is we take a map and we list the 22 states since 2010 that have passed voter suppression laws. And you know what we find? That if the state has passed voter suppression law, you can almost predict when you overlay it that it has the highest level of poverty, the highest need for health care, the highest need for a living wage. But you can also predict that they have elected the most politicians who are an the antithesis of the policies that would provide living wages, that would lift up the poor, that would protect immigrants, that would protect the LGBTQ community, that would protect labor rights and workers' rights. What am I saying? There is a deliberate disunity design because as Dr. King said, if poor and working class white people and poor and working class black people and other people of color and struggling ever got together in the South, the South would no longer be able to be divided. So there is a deliberate attempt and we must understand it and unpack it. Those, peop those who use the code language of racism and the tactics of racism to get elected then turn around and, in and, put in part and, and implement policies that hurt more white people. Because there are eight million more poor white people than there are black people. There are five million more poor white people than there are Latinos. So many of them use racialized tactics to get elected, but then use their power to favor an oligarchy that benefits from our disunity. We have to stand and take on this deliberate disunity. This deliberate disunity, all, and, and the country's so ready. Look at Boston. Look at Charlottesville. Look at you tonight. I've been going all over the country organizing with Liz for the Poor People's Campaign. And we, we're running, and we started in New Mexico and then went to Kansas and, and then the other day in Kentucky and had West Virginia and Tennessee. And everywhere we are going, people are showing up. Black, white, brown, red, gay, straight, young, old, and every time we have a mass meeting, we have thousands in the audience and thousands online because people understand that in America, we need a breakthrough through the deliberate disunity and the deliberate deceptions that are going on and deliberate demonization so that we can eventually be the people God has intended us to be. We need a breakthrough. Yes, yes, and so as I make my way to my seat, we all need a breakthrough, but to get a breakthrough, we need deliberate determination, not just one time action. And that's why a group of us, and we hope that the Charlottesville clergy will join us, are planning for 40 days of nonviolent action in 2018 to launch a new poor people's campaign and a call for national morality and a moral revival. We need a moral revival. And we, we understand that for there to be a moral revival, we must address systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and national morality all as one, not as separate. We can no longer be divided. Well, I'm so honored that you would invite us here today, the congregants of Charlottesville, congregations of Charlottesville, because they have a message for the nation. Like the friends who pulled the roof off, they could have been scared away by the people at the door, or the people with the torches, or the people with the loud voices, or the people with the guns. They could have fought each other, these, these, these people who have come together, but they came together, and they're coming together like these friends who fought for their friend to get to Jesus. 
those friends in the text, they could have worried whether the local authorities would charge them with breaking and entering. But love compelled them to act in spite of their fears. Love compared them to, to, to break through the barriers. And in this moment, we must trust love over fear. In this moment, we must reach deep into the wisdom of revolutionary nonviolence. Dr. King, after he was challenged on the effectiveness of nonviolence in the face of brutal attack, he said this, we must begin to turn mankind away from the long and desolate night of violence. May it not be that the new man the world needs is a nonviolent man. Longfellow said, in this world a man must either be an anvil or a hammer. We must be the hammers to shape a new society rather than anvils that are molded by the old society. This not only will make us new men, but will give us a new kind of power. It will not be Lord Acton's image of power that tends to corrupt the absolute power that corrupts absolutely. It will be the power infused with love and justice that will change dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. And so my friends, we must build a moral movement, willing to break through the barriers that keep us from really dealing with the sin sickness of racism. A movement that says to America, that to every politician, to every preacher, that just denouncing the extreme violence that occurred here, which you should do, and declaring that having done so is addressing white supremacy and white nationalism has been accomplished is not enough. No, we must have a movement. The test of any democracy is the policy it pursues. So we must say to every politician, especially those who, are, who have denounced, they say, the hatred here, will these same political leaders who denounce the extreme hatred, renounce the mean-spirited, race-driven, and socially violent policy agenda of white supremacy that precipitated and emboldened the actions that happened here in Charlottesville? We must break through the barriers, will they stand together with the clergy of Charlottesville and embrace a moral agenda? Will they issue a joint call and resolution to immediately terminate all the positions and the facets of white supremacy and Bannon and alt-right and Breitbart in the White House and censor the president for all of his overt and covert racially divisive language? Will they fully reinstate the Voting Rights Act? Will they acknowledge, will they acknowledge the racist voter suppression practices in 2016? Will they endorse the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court about racial gerrymandering? And if they're serious about this democracy, if you can be registered for war at 18, will they automatically register everybody to vote at 18? We want to heal it. We want to break through the barrier. You want to break through the barriers? If you want to break through the barriers, will they stop racializing Obamacare and claiming that everything Obama did is bad, which is a part of the white nationalist narrative? Will they stop racist white nationalist attacks on immigrants and oppose the RAISE Act and extreme deportation? Will they condemn the political rhetoric and the policies that target the LGBTQ community, the Jewish community, and the Islamic community? Will they increase the investigation of unarmed black and black and brown women and men and children who are shot by police. Will they repent of how silent they were when Trump promoted birtherism to the delight of all of the white nationalism for years? And will they stand and say that white nationalists don't care about poor and working poor of white America? They don't support living wages. They don't support health care. They don't support the working poor. They support the kind of policy that would take those things from white people. If you want those things, you need to hook up with the Charlottesville clergy and those of us who are standing for justice. And finally, 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 
Lord, help me today. Will President Trump and the so-called white evangelists, who are evangelicals, who have embraced him, repent of the race baiting and hate baiting Trump used in his campaign? Or will they keep silent and continue to consecrate his action with their prayers and their support? My friends, to say you are against white supremacy without standing against the rhetoric that emboldens white supremacy and the policies that endorse the white supremacy reeks of a terrible ignorance and a deliberate hypocrisy. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot be against the statues and not be against the statutes that keep alive the deceptive and deliberate division of white supremacy. Hallelujah. So after, after Charlottesville, our nation is presented with a clear choice. We got to make a moral choice. We can break through the barriers or we can build more walls and strengthen the barriers that reinforce the structures of sin and racism. Republicans must renounce and repent in full the ways in which they embraced the racist tactics for years and invited white supremacy into the political structure. But Democrats also have to repent because many Democrats refuse to name and confront policy-driven racism. Instead, they attempt to frame every issue in economic terms for the white middle class and working class. And they only talk about racism when we talk about David Dukes or something of that nature. This cannot continue. We must call racism what it is, no matter what the policy is. We have to, we have to denounce the political agenda of white nationalism and white supremacy line by line and precept by precept. Let us be clear, white supremacy is not now nor ever has been strictly a southern sin. Racism is not partisan or a regional issue. It is as American as apple pie. It is our nation's original sin. And the church must denounce the policies driven by racism and hatred. Or otherwise the church is guilty of an unholy silence. And if, and if, and if all you do, if all the time you talk about racism is in the extreme cases, in extreme cases, then you commit the sin that James Baldwin talked about when he said sentimentality is the mark of dishonesty and the mask of cruelty. We must choose the way of breakthrough that others have chose before us. Before the Civil War, abolitionists came together and they broke through. Following the nation's civil war, black and white poor and white people, formerly enslaved people and free poor white people, they chose to work together and build fusion coalition and they broke through. In the 1960s, Rosa Parks saw the death of Emmett Till. She didn't pick up a knife. She didn't pick up a gun. She picked up that old nonviolent hammer of love, truth, justice, and determination. She sat down on a bus and birthed a moral breakthrough and pushed the nation into a new place. That's what happened. Every effort towards reconstructing America has required a movement of people coming together across dividing lines of race and class and party to engage in our deepest moral tradition and imagine new possibilities. Now is that time again for another breakthrough in America. And it begins in Charlottesville. We who believe in freedom, we who believe in freedom, we who believe in freedom, we cannot rest forward together, not one step back. Seth, we take our lead from you all. We cannot give up on this nation. 
We cannot give up on this democracy. We cannot give up on this humanity. We must believe breakthrough is still possible. Deliverance is still possible. Redemption is still possible. Even some of our enemies will become our friends. That is still possible. Didn't you hear? Didn't you hear Heather's mother say, they tried to kill my child and shut her up. Well, guess what? You magnified her. Love, justice, truth, and nonviolent determination are the only way to a breakthrough. We need the love for one another that is honest about how we got here. Love that is not afraid to speak truth to this nation. Love that wants justice for all. And love that has a nonviolent determination to never give up. It's time for a breakthrough. We must break through the silence. We must break through the hate. We must break through the racism. We must break through the great greed. We must break through the violence. And we must break through the bad theology and we must break through the despair. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, it's time for a breakthrough. In the name of all that's holy, we break through your despair. Can I take my seat? All I want to say is I still believe that Red Seas can be parted. I still believe that narcissistic Nebuchadnezzar can be shut down. I, I, I still believe, I still believe that dry bones in the valley can be restored. I still believe that crucifixion Fridays can become resurrection Sundays. I still believe that weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning do you believe we need a breakthrough and when we break through the glory the glory the glory will be ours when every system is torn down when every child is loved when every human being is cherished when we are one nation under God indivisible 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 with liberty and justice for all then 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 the glory 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 will come. Bring me just just as many thanks as I do. Thank you for the kind words. Bring me the Amen. 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 Unless we deal with this deliberate deception, the deliberate demonization, and the deliberate disunity, America will be paralyzed. But if we break through, not only is forgiveness of the sin of racism possible, but new legs to walk and a new nation to be. These clergy are in a long-term struggle. And even those who preach to us sometimes get tired. Because when you really decide to be prophetic, and even if you decide to be lovingly and nonviolent prophetically, the power structures will not like it because you will hold all people accountable. I want to ask, they had asked me to pray, I want us to pray for the clergy. 
I want the clergy to come to the altar. And I want somebody to stand behind the clergy that doesn't look like you in skin color or favors you in your outward sexual appearance because I know that that may be many but I want you to come I want them to stand right at the altar facing the altar we got some kneeling places you may I'm gonna leave it I'm, you don't have to kneel you don't have to kneel and my dear sister organizer, Brittany, I want you right there so we can let you and Seth right there, you, because you're organizing it. And see, anytime you're organizing, stuff gets organized against you. So if you'd stand between, turn facing this way, all the clergy. Now, I want the cameras to show this. See, this is what they, not, they won't show. And then they're going to go outside and make this statement. And then I want... Now, is there a person in the audience that will come and stand behind each member of the clergy? And clergy members, if you need to come on around and come inside, the pastor doesn't mind. Find a clergy person that does not look like you. Jonathan, thank you. Come on, y'all. Come on, clergy. Right, fill on in right around. Is that good? Now, I'm going to do something not because I can but because I feel it, and I'm going to believe Seiko and others, the Holy Spirit will take it. I feel like going on. Everybody touching a preacher. I feel like going on. for such a time as this I feel like pressing my way I feel you represent the hope of this moment my way you will represent the hope I feel we have to hear from you everybody else can't tell this narrative you have to tell it hey, oh try Yours come on every hand. I feel like going on. Just hum for a second. See, the power of this diversity is that you're going to convince some of the ones that are on the other side. <laughs> Get ready for that now. Get ready to have to welcome somebody who may have been your adversary. And that's why they fight this so hard. Name. See, if it was just black, if it was just white, if it was just Christian, <laughs> but it's Jewish, it's Christian, it's Muslim, it's Pentecost. <laughs> and Pentecost is always dangerous to those that who believe in hatred. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you, those of you with, with, with what the Bible calls, uh, um, well, what we call gray hair. I want to honor you. No, no, really, really. I want to honor you because you've seen these battles and you thought, you know. But let me tell you, we feel like go. See, some of you all, the Lord has kept alive to suit up one more time. Some of us got to suit up for the first time. Huh? And some of us got to suit up because we're living, because we're living off of the struggles of others. Thank you. Trials come. And that's why some of you couldn't die. I know what the doctor said. I know what the doctor said. I feel 
like going. They told me in 2011 I'd be dead before Christmas. They sent that to me and my children. But you know you're going to be here till God calls you. <laughs> so you might as well stand. You might as well stand. You might as well fight for love and justice. Feel like going. Assalamu alaikum. Amen. I feel like Hallelujah. In the name. In the name of all that is holy. Pastor, we pray we know to open up this space on every hand and the risk it takes, the calls you get. But Jesus called you. Oh, no bit, no church called Jesus called you, and you stand with the gospel, and the gospel will take care of you. I feel, thank you, Brother Seco, for being here. Going on, I feel like go. Everybody, everybody, stretching your hands this way. If you want to participate, stretch your hand toward these preachers. On the try come round every. And I feel like going on. Now just hum it. I don't want to pray much because when Jesus dealt with demons, he didn't talk a lot. Neither did the prophets of old. They spoke clear. I want to, if you don't mind, I want to pray in my full tradition. Yeah, I got a shepherd or he got a double hoose, he got a double hoose, he got a double shock, or a double sack, a shake, and a double. He got a double see, and I got shot at a boho, so he shot at a bush. Gee, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. We wake up some mornings and why, wonder why we've got to battle the manifestations of what our parents battled. But God turn us from the question of why to the decision of must. Empower us to do what we do in love, to do what we do in truth, to do what we do for justice, and to do what we do with determined nonviolence. God, empower the clergy here in Charlottesville. Just like you empowered the clergy of Selma and the clergy of Montgomery, empower them, God, to be a moral voice to this nation and this world. Strengthen them, God. Strengthen them for your glory that they might be who you have called them to be. Yes, Lord. Now, God, now, God, we cannot pray for ourselves without the hard prayer of blessing those who despitefully use us. Yes, Lord. We pray now for the confused members of the human family who have made us their enemies and do not know how we long to be their friends. Yes, Lord who understand that we stand against that which is destroying them. Mm. And we have to. Yes. And we can't be. And we won't be silent anymore. Amen. Thank you now. Thank you, Lord. In God's name. Yes. Amen. 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 Clergy, please, please stay here up front and let's face this beautiful congregation. We want to hear from these clergy of Charlottesville. No, please, let's stand together, all together. We've invited the media in who patiently waited outside as, uh, as we've 
worshiped and fellowshiped together. And now let me, um, who's going to begin the statement on behalf of the Charlottesville clergy? Reverend Brittany. Dear friends and faith across the United States, will you commit to counteract the narrative and agenda of white supremacy? In the aftermath of multiple deaths, we bear witness to the need for every American to understand that the isolation and divisiveness of white supremacy is the way of death for all people, and particularly for the most marginalized among us. Therefore, we call on you to embody love over fear by proclaiming these truths, which are in stark contrast to the evil ideology of white supremacy. Black lives matter. Yes. Queer lives matter. Yes. Indigenous lives matter. Yes. Differently abled lives matter. Yes. Refugee lives matter. Yes. Jewish lives matter. Yes. Hispanic and Latino and Latina lives matter. Yes. Trans lives matter. Yes. Muslim lives matter. Yes. Immigrant lives matter. Yes. And Asian lives matter. Yes. As members of Congregate Charlottesville's clergy, we thank you for your many demonstrations of love and solidarity since white supremacists and neo-Nazis attacked our city. As we said to the violent hate mongers who pushed us to the ground and cursed us outside Emancipation Park, love has already won. We know by faith that love wins, even when we cannot see it, and we have committed ourselves to trust love over fear. The nation's response to events here in Charlottesville makes clear that we need moral leadership in every community. As followers of God, we call all people to admit that white supremacy is a structure of evil, injustice, and oppression. We as people of faith must engage in the long, deep work of dismantling white supremacy in all of its forms. We must confront and counteract white supremacy within ourselves, within our communities, and within legal, political, and religious systems. White supremacy is a systemic sin mm. that is not unique to Charlottesville or to the South. It is woven into the DNA of the United States. We call upon you to partner with us in the holy task of denounce, renouncing and confronting white supremacy and dismantling the white nationalist agenda in your own community. Together with God, we can restore God's vision of a world where all are welcomed and affirmed in their full humanity. Let us be clear. We will not allow our leaders to condemn hate while they continue to condone the policies and practices of white nationalism. And opposing white supremacy is not a partisan issue. That's right. All people of faith and conscience must commit to the deep work of justice. All elected leaders at local, state, and national levels have the power and moral obligation to enact policies which uplift, protect, and provide for the most marginalized in our society. As an act 
of choosing love over fear, we call upon all people, especially our faith and public leaders, to choose to stop racist voter suppression and gerrymandering by fully reinstating the Voting Rights Act. Choose. Choose to oppose the RAISE Act, defend DACA, and refuse funding for a border wall. Choose to work for comprehensive criminal justice ref reform and reject the law and order culture which has cast black and brown people as the enemy of America. Choose to condemn political rhetoric and policies that target the LGBTQ, Jewish, immigrant, and Islamic communities. And to choose to support access to health care, affordable housing, jobs, and equal access to goods and services for all people. We call on you to join us. We call on you to join us at an individual level, inside of your own selves, inside of our own selves, to dismantle white supremacy and to dismantle our complicity with it. We call on everyone, but particularly the faith communities around our country, to dismantle white supremacy and all of the oppression which has been a part of who we are for far too long. Amen and amen. Now I'm gonna ask you as you're able to stand and join hands across the aisle with people next to you. Beloved, Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God with gladness and singleness of heart. And the blessing of God, the God in whose image all humankind is made, be with you this night and remain with you always. Amen. Lord, cover me in love as the struggle it goes on. And say my name till something beautiful is born.